We're in the Kuzari on page 132, and we were speaking about the afterlife up until now. We've been off, off text. We've been off road uh, for a couple of weeks, off text. First, we discussed the Rambam in depth in his Mishnah commentary to Sanhedrin. And then we looked at last week at sort of a review that we found in the Kliyakar based on the Abarbanel, who goes through multiple reasons why the afterlife is conspicuously missing from Tanakh. And we're going to continue now along the text of the Kuzari. And remember, Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's whole approach is that the afterlife experience is for here, the here and now. We experience a semblance of the afterlife any time we can join with the Rebona Shalom in this world through the prophetic uh, power that is unique to the Jewish people. A person experiencing prophecy is experiencing ultimate conjunction with God to the extent possible while still confined to a physical body. And that's really a more fulfilling and gratifying experience that then the afterlife experience, which is also that very same conjunction, but in a disembodied state. That was Rabbi Yehuda Halevi Shita, and that's why there's no reason to emphasize the afterlife, because we experience the afterlife in this life. <coughs> okay, that's just a quick review. Now let's continue, we're on page 110. And I think we're just gonna do one paragraph today. The Kuzari said, How far-fetched it is to believe that the human being can be completely destroyed, losing both body and soul. Only the philosophers, based on their own beliefs, could maintain such a notion. Page 132, paragraph 110. So, sorry, did I tell you the wrong page? Sorry, my bad. We'll try again. Page 132, paragraph 110. And the Kusari is commenting now on the whole concept of the afterlife in general. The suggestion that there is no afterlife was suggested by a certain group of philosophers. And he says, how far-fetched it is to believe that the human being can be completely destroyed, losing both body and soul. Only the philosophers, based on their own beliefs, could maintain such a notion. Now, in footnote 175, is that the philosopher's belief is that only a perfect intellect can survive after death, attaching itself to the active intellect. Now, the reason why he included that note is because later on in the Kuzari, he's going to have, be having a discussion about what philosophers believe. And it seems like there's a contradiction in the Kuzari itself. Because later on, when he goes in a more thorough discussion of philosophical beliefs, which is all the way in the fifth essay, we're still still in the first essay, so don't worry. We won't get there for a long time. But it, it's somewhere in the middle, buried in the middle of the fifth essay is a discussion of immortality from a philosophical perspective. There is a belief in immortality for most philosophers, and we know that the king of philosophers is Aristotle, for both Rebbe Yehuda Halevi and for the Rambam. And so at face, at face value, what the Kuzari is mentioning in the name of philosophers does not ring true, because philosophers do believe in immortality. So what does he mean when he says that both body and soul can be destroyed when in reality, Aristotle does subscribe to a theory of immortality. So there are a couple of things that we need to keep in mind. What Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is alluding to here, I believe, is a very important philosophical dilemma of the medieval ages. And that is not the immortality of the soul, but the individuation of the soul after death. And I'll just explain the, the, the concept so that we can have at least an appreciation of what the philosophical dilemmas that were circulating or sort of the discussions that were circulating in the times of Rabbi Yehuda Halevi. <clears throat> if you remember, going back to the very beginning of the book when we talked about the Khazar king interviewing the various individual clerics, he had interviewed a philosopher. 
and he asked the philosopher about his belief. And if you want to go back just to see what, what he, the, the uh, philosopher had said, I'll tell you what page it's on. Okay, it's on page 52. Actually, 53. Page 53, which is the first paragraph of the Kuzari, where the philosopher is describing how one attains perfection. One attains perfection through perfecting one's intellect. And we talked about this term called the active intellect. In Hebrew, Seichel HaPoel, something that's described by the Kuzari, by Rabbi Halevi, as something real within Jewish thought, and something that is described by a number of different Rishonim of this period as being an authentic Jewish principle in addition to being a, an, a philosophical principle. What is the Seichel HaPoel? What is the active intellect? It's sometimes, by the way, in textbooks known as the, not just the active intellect, but also the agent intellect. You may see those terms used interchangeably, active intellect versus agent intellect. The term means that, and this was a concept that was developed by the Arabic Aristotelians of the medieval period, it refers to an angelic being that exists out in the cosmos that is an emanation of God, <coughs> that is responsible for infusing humanity with the ability to have cognition or thought. And the way that one achieves immortality is by perfecting his intellect so that he connects with this a collective angelic intellectual force. And once you raise your, your own intellectual powers to a certain threshold of proficiency, you're connected permanently, you're plugged into this atmospheric intellect, this active intellect, so that when you die, you remain immortal. Okay, that's the principle that this philosopher on page 53 is referring to. And therefore, if you look at that subparagraph 15 on page 53, he writes as follows. One soul becomes like an angel specifically acquiring the lowest level within the class of angels, which grants one a sense of being incorporeal. One is then on the level of the active intellect. The active intellect itself is an angel whose level is just below the angel who oversees the moon. The angels are completely devoid of physicality and have always been this way. They also live eternally and thus they never have to fear destruction. It therefore follows that anybody who has become one with the active intellect likewise never has to fear destruction. It is very comforting to know that one is in the same group as Hermes, Asclepius, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. If one reaches this level, then he and they and everyone else who reaches that level become a single everlasting unit. So, you come to page 132 now, paragraph 110. And it seems like Rabbi Yehuda Halevi is contradicting himself because if the philosophers that he has described at the beginning of the book do espouse a theory of immortality, then how can he say that the body and the soul are completely and utterly destroyed? That's our question. And it, the only reason why it poses itself as a question is only because of a very subtle distinction between immortality and individuation. Immortality means that you live on eternally, you exist for all time, but individuation means that you are one isolated neshamala, one isolated soul that retains your individual spiritual <laughs> characteristics that remain distinct and separate from all of the other neshamas that have passed on to the next world. 
for, for Aristotelian Arabic philosophers, this was a big issue. This was a big issue. The most famous proponent of the lack of individuation was a very famous Arabic philosopher called Averroes, who lives in the 12th century. He was just a little boy when Rabbi Yehuda Halevi died, but he developed this doctrine that was already being popularized in Rabbi Yehuda Halevi's lifetime. And that is that, we, that there's a philosophical belief in immortality, but it's an immortality as a completely uh, as complete pure intellect. In other words, all of your thoughts plug into this collective intellect, and there's no longer a you involved. There's no longer a you. So when Aristotle says he believes in immortality, he doesn't believe in the immortality of the soul, because the soul implies something that is individual to one person, to one human being. Immortality of intellect simply means that whatever was collected by you in your lifetime gets brought back up to this intellectual collective and then you live on in some way, not as an individual, but as part of a collective body of ideas or knowledge. So this is something that is extremely vexing to Jewish philosophers because it seems to contradict our conception of schar va'onesh, of individual reward and punishment. And in order for you to get an idea about what this conflict is, what the dilemma and what the controversy is about, let's look at a page from an encyclopedia of medieval philosophy, which I just did a screen capture off of Google Books, so it's a little bit fuzzy, the text, and I apologize for that. But this is just one of many different discussions that go on in various different textbooks and encyclopedias. And this actually is the entry, the encyclopedia entry for the letter G for Gersonides. Who was Gersonides? Anyone know? Gersonides? Good, good guess. No, but it's Rebbe Levi ben Gershom. It's, who was Rebbe Levi ben Gershom? The Ralbag. The Ralbag. Anyone ever heard of, you've heard of the Ralbag, of course, because he has a very famous... Nach commentary, yes, a very famous Tanakh commentary. But what is less well known about the Ralbag, and fortunately it's less well known, because if people knew more about the Ralbag's philosophy, they wouldn't allow his commentary into the, into the base measures. Because his philosophy was extremely close to Averroian, Aver, Averroian philosophy. One of the major conflicts between Christianity and Islam in the philosophical sense was this very topic of the individuation of the soul. Thomas Aquinas, who was one of the great Christian philosophers of the Middle Ages, writes that the reason why Islamic philosophy is untenable completely is primarily because of this one issue. So I'm just, you're just coming in in the middle of a discussion about the Ralbag because the Ralbag saw it as his duty. Ralbag is a late, much later Rishon. He only come on, comes on to the scene in the late 13th and early 14th century. So he's 150 years after Rabbi Yehuda Levi. And let's see what he has to say. He says, and I'm just, the, the three words that are from the previous pages, among the Arabic Aristotelians' greatest sins at least in the eyes of his Christian critics, was the denial, here he's talking about Averroes, was the denial of an individual personal immortality. Averroes had argued that the material intellect in a human being is not a particular product of the union of a body, which is matter and in an individual soul, but rather simply the manifestation in that person of the single all-embracing agent or active intellect. Thus, a person's soul, the form animating his body, is nothing but the agent intellect itself. In other words, what, what makes you alive in thinking is that you're plugged in in some way to this collective intellect, but there's nothing individual about you. You're just there to suck in. You're a sponge to draw in ideas into this collective. And his cognitive powers and achievements are simply the direct activity in him of that higher intellect, which actualizes certain potentialities in his body. All human beings, that is literally, 
share the same form. The agent intellect is common to them all. And a person thinks only because of his union or conjunction with the agent intellect and the intelligibles it contains. Although in itself general, the agent intellect undergoes a temporary process of individuation when it is attached to and embodied in an individual human being in a lifetime. The only time that you experience individualized and individuated intellect is on a temporary basis when, the, when there's intellect that is stuck into a wedge of physicality which we call a human body, okay? However, but since the agent intellect is in truth one, and thus the same in and for all individuals, when a person dies, all such individuation acquired through the body disappears, and his soul reverts back to its transcendent, separate, impersonal existence as the pure agent intellect. There is no personal immortality for Averroes. And that's what Rabbi Yehuda Alevi is talking about over here. When we talk about the destruction of the soul, we are talking about not the lack of immortality, but the destruction of the individual to be foregone for the collective. What's curious is, is that the Ralbag was banned. His philosophy was banned by many religious thinkers that came after him. And the reason why he was banned is that even though he had set out to combat the Averroian way of thinking, that there is no individuation of the soul after death, he ended up with some kind of compromise, which made it seem very much like that he was at least conceding to Averroes in one small, in one small way. In some small way. So let's take a look and see how the Ralbag understands this and see where the Ralbag got himself into trouble or where people perceive the Ralbag got into trouble. Yes, one second. You want to know if the tape is running? Yeah. It's not responsible, but... It's recording. Okay. Yeah. Just keep speaking. <laughs> no, so that's someone's phone. Oh, okay. okay. Just yeah. a quick question. Um, are you saying then that this idea is uh, the idea in Islam or a certain group of people who have it to be? That's a very good question, and I, I thank you for asking it because I need to clarify. It's Islamic philosophy is not the same as Islam. Just like Jewish philosophy is not always the same as Judaism, okay? You have a Torah and you have a Quran. What the Rambam writes in his Moren Nevuchim, in his Guide for the Perplexed, is Jewish philosophy. It is his way of presenting Judaism in philosophical terms. Averroes was a Muslim, but he was first and foremost a philosopher. And therefore, he presents his understanding of Aristotle and is able to successfully avoid being beheaded because he professes a reconciliation with Islam. Right? Whether or not this is reconcilable with true Islamic theology is not for us to debate. Right? Averroes was under strong attack by his Islamic community, probably even more than the Rambam was under attack from the Jewish community for his philosophical ideas. But you can certainly see, but just by relating it to Maimonides, how sometimes Jewish philosophy is not the same thing as Judaism, right? So thank you for raising that. Yes? I don't understand all of this emphasis on the intellect. Um, if you take that to its logical conclusion, then the most brilliant people should be the most good people, uh, deserving of the most immortality. Correct. But we all know brilliant, evil people. Yes. So, Yes, so that's why Aristotle writes his Nicomachean Ethics, because he writes that a truly brilliant person can only be brilliant intellectually by divesting himself of all of his physical vices. So he equates goodness with perfected intellect. And that seems to be the philosophical medieval world in which this is being written. You can only perfect your intellect if you are live a virtuous life, because then you're divested of the physical things that pull you away from perfected intellect. Perfected intellect can only be realized if you get rid of all of the evil within your life, which is associated with physicality. Let's continue along and see what Gersonides has to say. Remember, Gersonides is the Ralbag. He is aware of the philosophical problems here. For example, if all human beings literally share the same intellect, he argues, 
then how can we account for the different intellectual attainments of different people? But of even greater importance, it seems, are the religious and theological objections he has in mind. As Gersonides goes to great lengths to distinguish his own view of the soul from that of Averroes, he concentrates especially on the issue of personal immortality. If the human intellect is really nothing but the agent or active intellect, then immortality is of no practical value or moral consequence. For, he suggests, it would follow that all human beings, whatever their character or virtue, be he fool or sage, good or evil, will, because they literally share the same eternal soul, obtain this alleged immortality. That's one of the arguments that the Rabbag makes. There's no personal schar va'onesh. Moreover, if immortality is indeed a totally impersonal affair, as Averroes claims, then it can have no relevance for our very particular lives. Gersonides believes that his doctrine of personal immortality avoids these problems. And therefore, the, the Rabag himself has to come up with a solution, while at the same time still appreciating that intellect, by definition, has to at, sometimes, at some point coalesce into unity. And therefore, he argues as follows. He says, each person's acquired intellect is, he argues, a unity, numerically one, and thus can be distinguished without any reference to the body at all from other acquired intellects, even if those intellects have some knowledge in common. And then he says, one piece of knowledge can be common to Reuven and Shimon, yet differ in them insofar as the kind of unity differs in them. So that, for example, the unity in the acquired intellect of Reuven differs from the unity in the acquired intellect of Shimon. I'm not sure I understand what he means, but at the same time, he's trying to reconcile this very thorny dilemma of personal immortality versus an, into, an intellect, a collective <coughs> intellect, which is really one. So the, the, encyc the encyclopedist explains, he says, what gives each acquired intellect its unity and identity is both the amount of knowledge it involves and the content or character of that knowledge, not just its items, but also the way they are connected or synthesized. Different people acquire different and different okay. amounts of intellectual knowledge. This will presumably allow one disembodied acquired intellect to be distinguished from another. And Gersonides seems to think that a sense of selfhood will accompany this unity. He speaks of the happiness and pleasure that the immortal soul will feel when having been released from the body. It will contemplate the knowledge it acquired during its temporal embodied existence. And we'll hold it here in our discussion of philosophy. But I just wanted you to have an appreciation for the fact that there is this controversy that is raging about the immortality of the soul. Not so much whether there is immortality, but if there's individual immortality of the soul. Yes? So, it, for, good, for Gersonides, the, what he is referring to as the active intellect in this passage is also what we would call an neshama. Yes, well, you see, that's the thing, is that the Ralbag, as well as Averroes, avoid discussion of the soul. It may boil down to a definitional thing, a, a semantic issue, but Aristotle believes that the soul dies with the body. So if you're an Aristotelian, you can't really refer to the, if your, your personal immortality as a, an eternal soul. You refer to it as an eternal intellect that is individuated. So it, it becomes it becomes very um, uh, uh, it becomes very um, gray, different shades of gray, in trying to define what is is it that remains of you after you die. It's just it's interesting to note that the same things that you and I think about about what what am I going to be after I die, is very very carefully studied and analyzed in the medieval world, and that's why I wanted to point out in this paragraph that when Rabbi Yehuda Halevi talks about the philosophical belief that both body and soul are destroyed, that's what Aristotle says. But it's not that Aristotle believes that there's no immortality. There is immortality, but it's not of the soul. It's of your non-individuated intellect that becomes part of the collective active intellect. That's all I wanted you to see today. I hope that was not boring for you. OK. Yes. Last week, on the study of Hebrew, you said all the medieval commentators grapple with um, why Olam Shabbat is not mentioned in the Torah. And I was thinking to myself, 
how come I never noticed that? That should be such an obvious, glaring thing. But then, in the second section, when you spoke about Tarsha, and you talked about Rachel Mevaka Albaneha and how she was buried, Alderach Feslecha, Alderach Afrasa, so she could um, defend her children to Hashem, I realized that the reason it never bothered me is because the premise in so many of the things that we learn in school, starting in grade school, is that there is a soul, and it goes up to Shemayim, and it's with Hashem then forever. And that, I mean, how else can you understand Rachel Nevaka Albaneha unless she has a soul, and it's together with Hashem in Olam Haba? Well, you can understand it in a number of different ways if you don't look at it through the lens of Chazal. Well, if you, she dies, if, you, if you read that verse straight out of Jeremiah, then I contend that you can read that in a number of different ways. How can you understand it if she's dead? A voice of Rama is heard. Rachel is crying over her children. Now that, that could be a, a poetic statement of the fact that the matriarch of Israel, so to speak, who may not be even conscious and existent anymore, is, is figuratively crying over the, the, the pathos of the Jewish people being exiled from their land. You're right. So my point is that when you grow up with Chazal and you're always interpreting these things in this way, it never occurs to you, hey, why isn't Olam Abba mentioned in the Torah? Because it's a premise in so many of these Yes, chazals. and that's why it's time to grow up. Yeah. <laughs> we, we, in other words, and I don't mean that disrespectfully, what I'm trying to say is we have to stop viewing our study of Torah through a lens of childhood. We have to develop in the way that we look at Tanakh and in the way that we look at Chazal as well. And we have to learn to be able to look at the multi-tiered facets of Torah interpretation so that we have to know that while everything that Chazal say is true, but there's a pardes, there's pshat, remez, drush, and sod, and we have to know how to be able to separate them and to be able to see that on one level Chazal is speaking to Klal Yisrael to be able to reinforce certain very important yesode emuna, but at the same time appreciate that there are theological issues that we need to contend with at the same time.